In naval terminology, a destroyer is a fast, maneuverable vessel that is designed to escort other vessels. The need for such a class came from the development of the self-propelled torpedo, which allowed a fast but cheap torpedo boat to threaten large and expensive ships of the line, and thus the requirement for a class of vessels that had the endurance to accompany fleets, the speed to catch these torpedo boats, and the firepower to sink them, and thus the original name for the class, the Torpedo Boat Destroyer. By the turn of the 20th century, most modern navies had destroyer designs, but by the advent of the Great War, it had become an essential fleet element that filled multiple roles, including, of course, challenging the new great naval threat of that era, the submarine. And of all the tales of valor and accomplishment for destroyers during the Great War, the story of HMS Zubian is perhaps unique. The mere story of how the vessel was created illustrates the risks that these vessels faced in that war and the desperation of the times. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The F-Class Destroyer of the Royal Navy was first proposed by the first Sea Lord, meaning head of the Royal Navy, Admiral Jackie Fisher. Fisher had had a distinguished career in which he saw action in China during the Second Opium War between 1854 and 1860 and in the 1882 Anglo-Egyptian War. But it was in his posting between 1890 and 1902 as the Third Sea Lord, a position responsible for the superintending of the Department of Naval Construction, that he was central in creating the first true modern naval destroyer designs. In fact, it was Fisher who suggested the name Destroyer. In 1904, Fisher became First Sea Lord, and one of his initial tasks was to determine what to require for the next class of Royal Navy destroyers. The E-Class, also called the River Class, since the vessels were all named after British and Irish rivers, was well regarded. Using triple expansion steam engines and coal boilers, the River Class represented a significant step in destroyer design, focusing on greater endurance rather than just top speed. 36 River Class vessels were produced between 1903 and 1905. When it came time for a replacement, Fisher suggested much more engine power, using oil-fired boilers instead of coal. The resulting F-Class, called the Tribal Class, as the ships were named after native tribes, was a troubled design. While better armed and faster, the ships had to be nearly double in size to accommodate the larger boilers. Even then, they had to be relatively lightly built and proved fragile in combat. The larger boilers also consumed a lot of fuel, and fuel bunkerage on the design was generally considered to be inadequate. Perhaps most troubling, the tribal class was not standardized, with design details left up to individual builders. This resulted in a variety of designs, including HMS Viking, which sported six funnels, the only six-funneled destroyer ever built. Eventually, 12 F-class destroyers were built between 1905 and 1908. Among the last five built in the 1907-1908 program were HMS Nubian and HMS Zulu. HMS Nubian was laid down in May of 1908 and launched in April 1909, built by the Thornycroft Company in Portsmouth. She had a length of 255 feet, a beam of 26 foot 6 inches, and was armed with two 4 inch guns, one each front and aft, and two 18 inch torpedo tubes on each side amidships. She was four funneled, triple screwed, and had a crew of 70. She was commissioned into the first destroyer flotilla, part of the Channel Fleet. With the coming of the Great War, the 12 vessels of the tribal class were assigned to the Dover Patrol, a group assigned to prevent German shipping, particularly U-boats, from entering the English Channel en route to the Atlantic. The Dover Patrol assembled various vessels, including cruisers, monitors, armed yachts and destroyers, as well as motor launches and coastal motor boats, submarines, seaplanes, airplanes and airships. The patrol performed several duties in both the North Sea and the Dover Straits, including anti-submarine patrols, escorting other vessels, laying sea mines and constructing mine barrages, sweeping up German mines, bombarding German military positions on the Belgian coast, and of course, sinking U-boats. As such, the Dover Patrol was one of the most important Royal Navy commands of the Great War, and played a critical role in the first Battle of the Atlantic. Nubian saw her first hot action of the war, which was part of a force that bombarded German positions in Belgium in 1914. In March 1915, when the submarine SMU-8 became entangled in a submarine net in the English Channel across the Straits of Dover, Nubian, along with the tribal-class vessels Viking, Gurkha, and Maori, were sent to investigate activity that had been observed in the net. Gurkha used a tow device called an explosive anti-submarine sweep that forced the SMU-8, which had sunk five British merchant vessels the previous month, to surface, and under fire from the four destroyers, the crew of the submarine scuttled the vessel and surrendered. 
In April 1916, she participated in an operation to lay nets in mines in an attempt to limit the use of Belgian ports by German U-boats. She was joined in the operation by her sister tribal class vessel, HMS Zulu. In October 1916, HMS Nubian was involved in one of the largest battles that the Dover Patrol would see during the Great War, the Battle of the Dover Strait. The system of anti-submarine nets and minefields that the Royal Navy used to control access to the Atlantic was called the Dover Barrage. The barrage had to be constantly maintained, a duty that was often performed by what were called drifters. Naval drifters were small boats, either fishing vessels that had been requisitioned for use by the Navy or constructed for naval purposes by yards that typically built fishing vessels. The drifters, usually less than 100 feet long and lightly armed with a single naval rifle, acted as patrol boats, checking the nets and searching for German activity. As their armament was light, they were usually accompanied by destroyers for defense, and the tribal class destroyers of the Dover Patrol could be called if they came under attack. Prior to October 1916, the Imperial German Navy had assigned few vessels to challenge the Dover Barrage, and those were smaller vessels designed for coastal defense. As a result, the Dover Barrage had become complacent and was ill-prepared for an attack. But in October, the Imperial Navy reinforced their flotilla in Flanders with two flotillas of large torpedo boats. The large torpedo boats of the Imperial Navy were ocean-going vessels, and despite their title of torpedo boat, were actually larger vessels comparable to the destroyers of the Royal Navy. Unbeknownst to the Royal Navy, the Imperial German Navy now had a force that was capable of challenging the tribal-class destroyers of the Dover Patrol. The night of October 26, 27, 23 large torpedo boats of the Imperial German Navy entered the Dover Strait. Six attacked the patrol boats of the Barrage, 28 light naval drifters, when they were protected by a single destroyer, the outdated destroyer HMS Flirt, an armed trawler, and an armed yacht, a force that was heavily outgunned. Flirt attempted to ram one of the German boats, but was sunk by torpedoes and gunfire. Six of the drifters were sunk as the tribal-class destroyers HMS Amazon, Mohawk, Viking, Tartar, Cossack, and Nubian rushed to the battle. HMS Nubian was the first to arrive, but initially mistook the German boats as allies and were under fire before the other destroyers of the Dover Patrol could arrive. Nubian attempted to ram the last torpedo boat in line, but a torpedo exploded under her, just behind the bridge, nearly cutting the boat in two and rending her a drifting hulk. The rest of the destroyers engaged various groups of torpedo boats, taking damage to HMS Amazon and Mohawk, and doing little damage to the Germans in return. Nubian was taken under tow, but the tow lines were broken in bad weather, and the boat ran aground near Dover. The bow, which had been nearly severed by the torpedo, broke off and sank. The stern was trapped against a cliff, but was eventually refloated and towed to the dockyard in Chatham. Fifteen members of Nubian's crew were lost, and the fate of HMS Nubian would then be tied, rather literally, to another tribal-class destroyer, HMS Zulu. HMS Zulu was laid down in the Hawthorne Leslie shipyard in August of 1908. Construction was delayed, and Zulu was not launched until September 1909. 285 feet long, she had a beam of 27 feet. Assigned to the Dover Patrol, the outbreak of war, HMS Zulu captured a German sailing ship in August 1914, and joined Nubian escorting vessels laying mines in 1916. The minefield laid in that operation was suspected to have caused the loss of at least one U-boat, the UB-13. In November 1916, Zulu was sailing between Dover to Dunkirk when she struck a mine laid by the German mine laying submarine UC-1. The mine exploded beneath the Zulu's engine room, killing three men. The stern broke off and sank. The bow was successfully told to Calais. Already facing a shortage of destroyers, the Royal Navy decided to marry the bow of Zulu to Nubian's stern, creating a new vessel, HMS Zubian. The work, conducted at the Chatham Dockyard, was quite a feat of engineering, especially given that Zulu had a beam a half foot wider than Nubian. The two were joined between the third and fourth funnels, and recommissioned in June 1917. The new destroyer was said to have surprised the German Imperial Naval Command, who did not know that a ship of that name was being built, only finding out after the war that it was what is commonly called a Franken-vessel. The resulting 280-foot-long destroyer continued serving in the Dover Patrol. In February 1918, while in the Dover Strait, she encountered the mine-laying U-boat UC-50. The submarine was surfacing off Zubin's port bow when they encountered it, and Zubian attempted to ram it. The Germans managed to submerge, but Zubian dropped depth charges. Oil and wreckage was observed, and divers were able to later confirm that they had sunk the UC-50. 
earning a bit of revenge in that it was this type of boat that had laid the mine that had blown off HMS Zulu's stern. In April 1918, HMS Zubian took part in one of the most daring raids done by the Dover Patrol, an attempt to block the German-held Belgian port of Bruges. The Austin raid hoped to deny the use of the port by German submarines by seeking outdated, concrete-filled cruisers in the Austin Channel. Zubian was part of a force assigned to suppress German fire, but the raid was ultimately unsuccessful, as the Germans defending the harbor had moved a navigational buoy, causing the two block ships to run aground without blocking the harbor. In the end, three different operations to attempt to deny the German Imperial Navy access to the Belgian port failed to cut off the port completely. The limitations of the tribal class of destroyers were obvious before the end of the war, and HMS Zubian, whom you could argue had already had its life preternaturally extended, along with the rest of the ships of the class, was sold for scrap and broken up in 1919. The mere fact that Zubian was created was not just a marvel of naval engineering, but also uh, an example of how thinly the Royal Navy was stretched trying to defend its vital merchant fleet across the vast Atlantic. The damage to HMS Nubian and HMS Zulu showed the risks that the ships of the Dover Patrol took throughout the war, constantly under risk of mines, of U-boats, and of attack by German torpedo boats. And the battles in which the two ships that became one fought were illustrative of the small ship actions in a war that was much less defined by the giant fleet actions that many naval observers had predicted, but instead by the prolonged fight to try to protect the merchant fleet from what was then called the U-boat menace. And in that, the experience of HMS Zubian was just a small taste of what was to come in the next World War. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.